Tell me first about the monitoring network of thermal state of permafrost. Okay. Well, um, temperature is one of the most straightforward parameters which uh, allows us to understand if permafrost is in stable state or um, in some kind of danger. So that's why we're trying to measure temperature in as many places as possible. And one of these uh, very successful projects uh, was and still actually um, active is thermal state of permafrost, where we measure temperature in boreholes um, and uh, uh, in continuous manner. And of course, longer you measure, better you understand what permafrost is doing. How many are the boreholes and where are they? Well, uh, this international uh, project, uh, which was really started to develop as a really international project during the international polar year, uh, now account more than 800 boreholes in uh, both northern and southern hemispheres. Most of them, of course, in the northern hemisphere. And um, uh, the distribution of these boreholes is not equal. Uh, some places like Alaska, we have more boreholes than in places like uh, Siberia, for example. So there is still some, some work to be done to improve this uh, co uh, special coverage of, of, uh, of these boreholes. But it's a it's good, good number of, of, of uh, places where we measure temperatures. So. When did this project start and do you have any data yet to, for comparison? Uh, sure, yeah, it's, uh, as I said, that uh, the most active phase was during the uh, International Polar Year, so 2007-2009. However, many of those boreholes were uh, established many, many, many years ago. So some of the like, some of the sites we uh, have data for the last 30 years, more or less continuous data, which is very useful, very valuable to understand where we are right now in terms of changes in permafrost. Many of them, of course, started during this period of time, and we hope we'll continue these measurements. And in the years come, so we'll uh, continue to measure this and understand how permafrost change from now to now on. And uh, have you seen a lot of changes in permafrost? Uh, yeah, sure. And it's actually a very consistent picture uh, from different locations like Alaska, northern Canada, uh, northern Russia. So all this and, and uh, also uh, some Nordic countries, uh, Svalbard, uh, all, this, the, the, all this data show that permafrost is warming during the last 30 years. And uh, in many locations, temperature increase in permafrost was about 2 degrees Celsius, sometimes even more. Uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, also uh, common feature that permafrost warming faster in the cold state, the colder permafrost warming, warming faster than warmer permafrost. But uh, trend is pretty much, uh, well, more or less uniform. So we have uh, warmer Temp temperature in permafrost now than 30 years ago, for sure. What are the con consequences of the thawing permafrost? Well, uh, there's many consequences, uh, some of them local, some of them global. So in uh, local ones, it's uh, or regional, I would say it's an impact on infrastructure or on ecosystems uh, and uh, species, uh, both vegetation and animals, they are affected by these changes, and there are some winners, some, some losers. Uh, but uh, more on the global side is probably this uh, pos possible feed, uh, positive feedback between changes in permafrost, uh, thawing of permafrost and carbon cycle. So where we have uh, new carbon coming into the cycle from so far frozen and permafrost, uh, and uh, uh, increasing greenhouse gases concentration, which increase temperature, uh, warmer, warmer climate, more permafrost thawing, and so on. So typical positive feedback, and that's that's pretty much global uh, effect of changes in permafrost uh, related to concentration uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere into the in the, in the atmosphere. Would you say that uh, these effects are? are very big? Is this a, a very dangerous problem? Yeah, at this point, is uh, this effect is not, not really big uh, because degradation or thawing of permafrost is still very local so far. Uh, mostly it's uh, uh, 
degradation of permafrost related to thermocarst, thermal erosion, uh, development of some uh, thermocarst lakes and so on. So it's still pretty limited in landscape uh, because we didn't cross this threshold where widespread degradation of permafrost starts. But according to models, if we believe in models, so according to these models, this threshold could be somewhere between uh, 2030s and 2050s, where in many locations in the discontinuous permafrost zone, and even some locations in continuous permafrost zone, permafrost will start to thaw uh, widespread, not just in some very specific locations, but in, in many, many locations is in a bigger area. And uh, not only is the permafrost thawing, there are, uh, there are some other phenomena related to permafrost who also have various effects on the Arctic, like the uh, increased rates of coastal and riverbank erosion and uh, some other effects. Can you tell me about these? The riverbank, uh, uh, the riverbank uh, erosion, yes, and increased uh, occurrences of retrogressive thaw slumps and active layer detachment slides. Yeah, that's, that's what... Uh, this is one of these uh, uh, processes which I mentioned. They're still local, uh, but the number of, of those locations are increasing. Uh, and uh, of course, um, it's a kind of fast track uh, changes in permafrost. Uh, the longer track is uh, thawing of permafrost from the top down without these dramatic uh, sur surficial processes. And uh, those processes, they bring uh, this carbon very quickly to the atmosphere, well, to the surface at least, uh, or aquatic systems. And uh, in this way, it's a very effective way to degrade permafrost, really. Uh, again, it's still more or less local, uh, though it's, it's getting more common. And uh, there's also, also, of course, um, the same process can affect any kind of infrastructure, especially linear, linear infrastructures like roads, railroads, uh, pipelines. Uh, that's very, um, well, very dangerous processes, a slow process can affect this, even, even if the uh, pipeline itself could be pretty stable, but process, say, on the slope where this pipeline is going through, uh, can actually affect uh, promo uh, affect the pipeline itself, even if uh, permafrost under pipeline is still still stable. And uh, can you even link uh, food security to permafrost and its uh, thawing effects? Well, on, on food security, there's some um, some uh, worries about uh, the stability or, or safety uh, of these uh, uh, ice cellars and uh, which uh, local people uh, use in Siberia, in Alaska, in North uh, Canada, in many places. They use it as a food storage, uh, and it was traditional food storage. They use it for, for many, many hundreds of years even. And so far it was very useful, very uh, convenient way to store food. And now in many locations they, they have some problems with uh, continuing to use those ice cellars as a food storage because or water start to get into it or temperature is not cold enough. So there is some, some problems but at the same time there are some good examples and we saw them uh, at this conference that uh, some of those uh, cellars are still operational and in good shape so probably there is some way to really uh, redesign or, or make some some changes in design of these cellars to still continue to uh, possibly use them in the future. So that's that's one. Of course, effect on ecosystem will change. Like I said, species species composition and it could change the way how people local people hunt uh, and also transportation. So there are many problems with uh, uh, degrading permafrost and. Um, how to easy to reach from one point to another in the north now and that could affect also uh, uh, how how easy to get uh, food from hunting uh, wildlife so that's also another problem what about the access to fresh water uh, well this fresh water uh, many local communities they still use uh, surface water uh, for all needs including uh, drinking water of course after um, 
some some kind of filtering and and uh, uh, so some development. But um, now is all these sediments and water because of thawing permafrost and development of these uh, retrogressive slumps and all, all kind of erosional features, uh, it's getting more difficult and more expensive to use uh, surface water for water supply. What about uh, permafrost research? It's becoming stronger and uh, interdisciplinary research is of course more common. How important is that? Well, uh, uh, permafrost is just one component of a uh, bigger system and uh, uh, to understand how permafrost change and how changes in permafrost affect the whole system we have to study all other components together and it's very important to try to do it uh, at least at the same geographical locations uh, because very often uh, people who study some say vegetation changes or some um, geomorphological features changes. Uh, they don't measure temperature, for example. So they use data from other sites or from general knowledge that permafrost is warming. But is it warming exactly at that location where they do this this research, his research or her research? That's a very important question. So really, we have to get together and and, and organize all our research in in uh, uh, in, a, in a manner that uh, it will be not just looking at one of the components but really address whole system as it as it is and the only way to understand the system only way to understanding and predicting capability to develop this we have to work together that's for sure